So in part one, we covered what the price points in fashion design were, and we also uh, began our section on what makes a garment cost what it does. We went over fabric and we looked at what properties of fabric will contribute to how much it costs. Um, and now I want to pick up back on uh, our labor costs. So this is uh, the one of the three things, uh, the three factors that go into how much a garment will cost. The first was material, and again we covered uh, fabric and other materials in the previous video. And now I want to look at the second factor into how much a garment costs, which are the labor costs. Uh, labor costs refer to how much money is spent on the actual making of the garment. This means how much it costs to cut the fabric and sew the pieces together to make the final garment. Now that of course is the very basic definition of labor costs and depending on how complex the garment or a uh, garment specific needs, it may be more. It may be um, to bead the fabric, um, to uh, give the garment um, extra finishing, so on and so forth. So let's take a look a little bit about our, our labor costs. So um, simple construction is cheaper. Very obviously simple construction takes less time to make and so costs less in labor to produce. Clothing that is constructed can simply be identified uh, by the following. It has a minimal number of seams. It has a minimal number of pattern pieces. Typically only has one layer of fabric or materials. It has minimal to no additional garment details. So no pockets, no collars, no cuffs, no button plackets, um, no little zipper details, uh, whatever little details. And minimal to no embellishment, so no embroidery, no um, design printing, so I haven't printed little logos or, or graphic designs on here, no beading, no sequins, uh, nothing like that, no additional ruching. It also typically has a uh, limited amount of actual fabric. Now we haven't, uh, uh, I haven't gone over that very specifically, but I'll, uh, I think in the materials too, so very obviously the amount of material used in your garment um, will affect its price. So if you use a lot of material, it's going to be more expensive than a garment that doesn't use a lot of material. So that should be pretty obvious, but we may as well mention it. Now we go into simple construction too. I want to mention, um, so these sort of examples over here. So again, um, very minimal seam work. Um, our t-shirt itself has uh, your know, side seam, armhole seam, shoulder seam, pretty much as bare minimum to put it together. Um, no additional finishing, um, which we'll talk a little bit more in the complex construction. Um, and again, you know, these are really great examples of, of what makes a cheap garment because in addition they have, you know, um, uh, cheaper materials, so sort of just a cotton knit, a thin cotton knit. Um, again, the type of fabric does not influence the construction. We can take very complex weave constructions or very expensive fabrics and sew them very simply. So that might be a good way to sort of balance your uh, price point. So if you want to use maybe a fabric that would typically be a little bit more expensive than your price point would allow, if you make sure that the construction of the garment is very simple and doesn't use a lot of that um, fabric, you can still work within your price point, okay? So we always just sort of have to be thinking about these things about how to keep within our price point. So, as uh, if, if simple construction is cheap, we can assume that complex ex construction is more expensive. Um, complex construction not only takes longer to create, it requires a higher skill level as well. Uh, this means more complicated garments are more expensive to make. Pretty obvious. 
Uh, the qualities of a complicated garment are pretty much the opposite of what we look le looked at for the simple um, construction. They have many seams. They have numerous pattern pieces. They have lots of garment details. We have, you know, all these different pockets, moaning, um, uh, little clasps, things like that. Uh, lots of embellishments. So we'll see uh, embroidery and beading and um, maybe uh, complex printing and things like that. Uh, they'll have many layers of fabric and material. So here, the, you know, we have on the jacket, we have trims and we have uh, the shell and probably an inner uh, lining and probably material in between that to create insulation. Same thing with our corset over here. We have the outer shell fabric, which is this sort of lovely black uh, silk jacquard, and we'll probably have an inner lining, and we have the boning and stiffening agents on the inside, um, and they of course require a higher skill level to make. Um, as you can probably tell, you know, if I were to ask you to make that t-shirt from the previous slide, you say, oh, okay, but if I ask you to make this jacket, you might, oh man, I don't know about that, maybe a couple years down the line. Um, but, so, pretty obvious, right? Um, the more complex a garment, the more expensive it is. Um, and so we have to look at all these sort of different factors. In addition to our construction, I also, so I had mentioned finishing before, and I wanna just clarify that a little bit. So not all garments are quote unquote finished, or not all fabrics are, are quote unquote sort of finished. And when I talk about sort of a finishing process, um, I'm talking about something that might be done to the garment um, after it's put together. So what are some of the things that we can do? So um, one of the most common sort of finishing treatments that we see, um, we see in denim jeans. Uh, so people kind of like a weathered look to their jeans and when you take fresh denim, make a pair of jeans, they're very hard. Uh, they don't have any of the sort of characteristic um, sort of creases um, or uh, sort of signs of weathering uh, that we're used to seeing. In fact, if you looked at a unfinished pair of jeans made from fresh denim, um, it would look a little bit weird to you uh, because most all jeans that we see on the market go through a finishing or weathering process after they're made. And um, what happens is the jeans are made and they're, they're shipped off and they're quote unquote weathered. So they may be put in a big tumble dryer with a bunch of rocks to sort of break up and stiffen or, or soften uh, that stiff denim. Um, uh, workers will take little bits of sandpaper uh, to sort of soften the edges of the uh, cuffs uh, and the pockets to again sort of soften it. Um, they may even uh, press in or dye in uh, the creases that you'd see sort of at the upper thighs that you get from jeans from wearing them, you know, years and years and years. But we want our jeans sort of pre-weathered, so we have to send them out to a finishing factory uh, to do this. And this is actually one of the reasons why jeans are a little bit more expensive than one might think. They have a thick fabric, they have a fairly complex construction, and they typically also have this finishing. Now, uh, there's other types of finishing. Uh, a lot of times, dress shirts will be uh, treated with starch to keep the collars and um, cuffs stiff and crisp. Um, sometimes, other uh, uh, nowadays, other garments will be sort of chemically treated to make them stain or water resistant. Um, so on and so forth. So we have all these sort of different processes, but in the end, it's extra time and effort that needs to be done uh, to complete the garment. So of course, whenever we're talking about extra time or effort or even material, it means that a garment is going to be more expensive. So just to sort of wrap up our constru construction materials influences, um, let's compare and contrast two garments at the same price. So let's assume that I have a t-shirt over here. Um, it's simple, it's maybe a cotton poly jersey of light to medium weight, very simple construction, and it's $100. 
Um, because the material is not that expensive, the construction is not that complicated, I would consider this quite an expensive t-shirt. Probably well within, um, you know, our contemporary price point, even better price point. Um, however, moving over here, and I see a $100 leather jacket, it has lots of seams, it has lots of details, like even little extra um, sort of plackets on the cuffs. It's lined with maybe um, a very thick, fuzzy, bulky fabric. Um, it uses more uh, a skill to, to make. Um, even has an extra little belt there. If I saw that at $100, I might say, wow, that's a really good deal. Um, that's probably going to be something at a lower price point, or it might be discounted, um, because if this was real leather, uh, just the cost, if it, it was it, one of two things, it's either really, really low quality leather, um, or this simply did not sell, and it's now being discounted to $100. So when we look at price points, it's not just the sheer dollar amount that places a garment within a price point. Um, it's what you're getting for that dollar amount. Again, $100 for this t-shirt is really expensive because it's simple. The materials aren't that, um, uh, you know, um, expensive, construction simple. Uh, so $100, is going to be kind of high on our price point. Again, like I said, uh, probably on the contemporary level, maybe even bridge. Um, and this jacket, again, because of its complexity and so on and so forth, at $100 would be at probably, you know, um, more of the budget price range. Um, so again, it's not just the sheer dollar amount of the garment, it's what goes into it to produce that. Okay, so hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. So now let's uh, also talk about the labor quality. Um, so previously with the complexity, that's just the amount of labor um, uh, needed to create a garment. Of course, we did touch on the fact that more complicated garments will need a higher skill set, uh, but that's not just it. Um, not all clothing is sewn with quality, and it takes longer and can potentially require a higher skill set to sew a garment with quality. So even simple garments um, can be sewn with quality. Um, so simple construction can be sewn with quality, which again will take a little bit longer and require potentially a higher skill set. Um, so this is something that applies to both complex and simple con um, sort of garment construction. Quality is universal, um, and we can apply it universally or not. Um, so again, we can have very simple garments sewn with very, very high quality, and we can have very complex garments sewn without very good quality. And this is uh, because it takes a little bit longer and requires a little bit higher skill sets, um, good quality or high quality in garments is more expensive. Um, although high quality of sewing is costly, it ensures that a garment will last longer. So um, it also ensures that the garment will be a little bit more attractive, um, but again, it will help it um, stand up to the daily wear and tears um, and through washing and being taken off and just general use. Um, garments sewn with high quality, again, will just simply last longer. Um, that's why typically as a consumer, a high quality garment is typically a better investment for something that you want to keep around for a long time. So how do you know that a garment was made with high quality? What are the signs? Uh, the seams are well finished. So um, we finish the seams on the inside to prevent the fabric from fraying. Um, and the better finished they are, uh, the less likely that uh, the finishings will come out and the fabric itself will start fraying. Um, if we do not finish our seams at all, which is almost never seen, um, 
the fabric will start to fray after a use or a wash. Um, and once that fabric starts to fray, as soon as it comes down to the seam itself, uh, the garment will simply uh, fall apart. Now, if they're not well finished, the similar things can happen. Those finishings will come apart, the fabric will start to fray, and the garment will start to fall apart. In addition, um, areas that need it are well reinforced. So areas that uh, will commonly receive um, increased amounts of stress, say like a, a corner of a pocket or the crotch in your pants, um, are reinforced. And this can go for even areas of the garment that don't have specific tensile strength being applied to it, which means they're not being pulled or whatever else. But a lot of times, especially with woven garments, there'll be sort of hidden stitches that are reinforcing things like the neckline. And what they're doing is they're reinforcing the shape. So if we have a specific, especially very sharp shape to a neckline, it might need specific reinforcement to keep that shape. So um, reinforcement, again, is not just to help keep the garment together, to keep your pockets on, or to keep your crotch from splitting. Uh, they're to help keep the shape and look of the garment as well. Um, and this, that, those sort of shape reinforcements, again, they can apply to archoles, necklines, collars, uh, different things like that. The inside is finished attractively. A wonderfully, beautifully high quality sewn garment will be just as beautiful on the inside as it is the outside. Unfortunately, you rarely see that in stores today as qual general quality of garments has shifted um, to be very, very cheap and not as good quality. I'll talk a little bit more about more of that later. Um, so you'll also see on your high quality garments that top stitching is either numerous or skillfully hidden. Now this depends on what the garment is intended for. If I'm buying a garment that is made to be tough, like something like jeans, or something that is made to be a sort of work clothes, sort of workhorse, durable, strong, so on and so forth, you're gonna see a lot of top stitching, or at least you should. Because that top stitching is again another type of reinforcement um, meant to hold all the seams together, um, hold the hems together, um, so on and so forth. And the number of top stitching can indicate how long the garment will last. Um, so if I'm looking for something like hiking shoes or hiking pants, I'm looking things for things that are triple stitched on the top stitching at least. Um, again, the extra stitching um, adds to the reinforcement, adds to its strength, adds to its longevity, but of course, since it's extra, it takes longer to do and will be more expensive to add. Um, now, on the skillfully hidden side, this is going to be more for our dress clothing. So this is where you might see something like a blind stitch hem, which is a little bit more of a complicated hem finish with high to the top stitching. In fact, when you get to the more formal dressy side, uh, the typical rule of thumb is the less top stitching you see, the higher quality of sewing was used. Um, it's more difficult to finish garments, uh, do things like hems or facings, and not have top stitching showing. Although it gives it a bit of a cleaner look, um, it is more expensive to do because again, it's a little bit harder and takes a higher skill level to do these types of finishes that hide the top stitch. So if you're going to that sort of, uh, sort of long story short, on the sort of workhorse end of it, um, if you're looking for just durable clothing, you want to see a lot of top stitching. If you're going for a higher priced, formal, kind of dressy clothes, you don't want to see a lot of top stitching or else that's the indication that your garment is made with a high quality of sewing. When you actually look at the stitches themselves, they should appear even in length and in tension. So the actual sort of, the individual stitches should all be of the same length and you shouldn't see some a little bit tighter, some a bit looser. And if you see some that are coming up like a loose, uh, like a loose loop, forget about it. Uh, that means the tension was bad. 
um, which means that the stitch itself is very, very weak and probably will start to come apart very easily. And overall, the stitching and seam should be neat, even and attractive. So, you know, the, the stitch lines should not be wiggly. They should be even from all edges and, and from themselves um, and just generally should be attractive. Now, um, I mentioned before that quality overall in the fashion industry has gone down. And this is true. And you can see it on all levels. And this is unfortunate. And um, it's due to a few different things. One, it's due to the ignorance of the populace. People simply do not know how to look and analyze for quality in their clothing anymore. Um, it's also not just ignorance, but preference. Um, people don't want to keep clothing for an extended amount of time. People would rather um, just get new clothing every year and, and throw out the clothing from the year before, um, which is incredibly wasteful um, and you know not really necessary. Um, and you can still get new clothing every year, just so long as you know you keep it around, um, just to sort of you know cycle it and cycle it out. Um, I'm a proponent of keeping clothes for a long time. It's better for the environment. It's just um, less wasteful. Um, and it requires you to sort of look a little bit harder at what you're buying and why you're buying it. And also if you buy things for a longer time, you can simply get things of higher quality that cost more. So if I buy something that costs a $500 but keep it for the next 10 years, that is cheaper than buying, you know, something that's $50 um, every couple months. Uh, so, you know, um, in addition to that, uh, so there's, again, lots of reasons why we see lower quality in, in clothing. Um, it also has to do not just with the customer and their expectations, but also with uh, design companies themselves. Um, because the consumer is more leaning toward this, either they don't know about good construction or they just simply don't care because the clothing isn't going to be kept around long enough. Um, companies themselves will lower the quality of sewing uh, simply to get a higher profit for themselves. So um, if they're not putting the money into making higher um, quality garments, they're saving money by using cheap labor um, that is, you know, it, it faster uh, and also less expensive for them. So if that's a cost that they're saving, they're making more money because they either will sell it for the same amount of money or slightly less but are still getting that sort of extra boost to their profits. So they're fine with it um, and the customers are fine with it. So uh, unfortunately it's, it's a, sort of an industry trend right now that uh, is probably going to be around for a while until people start really caring about their clothes again and maybe caring about the environment because again this shift toward more disposable um, cheap garments uh, is is really quite wasteful and creates a lot of pollution um, in the in you know the excess making of these garments and also the disposing of them uh, and let's not rem uh, let's remind ourselves that you know at the lowest end of the spectrum is our synthetics so all that fast fashion that is made out of those polyesters and those nylons and those acrylics and things like that or even cottons that are blended with them are made out of yes plastic so it's plastic waste that we are needlessly adding into the environment um, just like all of our other uh, you know plastic waste just like our water bottles just like our plastic bags just like all of these other different things it's no different okay anyways just my little aside on sewing quality. Now I also want to go to the last section of our cost factors of a garment, which is performance. And this can be the most difficult to understand because it's a little bit more conceptual than, you know, obviously expensive fabric is expensive. Um, high quality or complex construction is expensive. This is a little bit more um, kind of philosophical 
uh, to understand except for our, our physical performance. So when I talk about performance, a garment's performance refers to how well it fulfills the needs of its wearer. So when a person puts on an item of clothing, that person needs that garment to do certain things. Some of those things are very simple and not important. And sometimes those things are very important and potentially very hard to do. So on just a very base level, all garments need to perform in the sense that I can put them on, they cover the bits they need to cover, um, and I can take it off again. That's the sort of bare minimum of performance that a garment needs to have. So every single piece of garment needs to have at least that level of performance. But we can go higher than that. And let's see some of the ways that we can do that. And in performance, I'm going to divide it into sort of two categories. We have our actual physical performance of the garment and we have a psychological performance of the garment. Now with physical performance of the garment, we're looking at the actual physical things that the garment is doing. It's doing very real things. It has very real performance requirements that it has to do. And the general um, example here is this mountain climber. This garment is doing a lot of things right now. It's protecting this guy from the cold. Um, it has different pockets where he has to keep his carabiners and his um, maps and compasses or whatever he's got. Um, he also probably on that garment has uh, places for his harness straps um, that need to obviously attach very well and not break because if you're on a mountain and you slip and fall, that is pretty much the only thing that is keeping you alive. Um, so if it breaks, that is very bad. So those are physical performance things. Physical things and attributes that a garment needs to um, per, uh, uh, needs to do. When we come over here to our psychological performance, again, this is a little bit more concept conceptual, a little bit more philosophical. Um, we wear garments in order to sort of communicate things about ourselves to our ourselves to sort of prove them to ourselves, but also to others. And when we think about this psychological performance. That is how well a garment is communicating to other people. Um, communicating something about us to other people. Okay, so I'm going to look at both of these categories a little bit more in depth. So first, let's take a look at our physical performance. So a lot of uh, garments that have very high physical performance needs are categorized into what is called technical garments. And clothing can do amazing things. This is sort of a very sm a smaller subset of fashion, um, but it's really truly amazing. So uh, clothing can protect us from fire, it can protect us from the cold, water, other harmful things. So of course, you know, firemen need outfits that protect them from fire. Uh, people that are doing exploring or things like that, like our mountain climber, need things to protect them from the cold. Um, fishermen or scuba divers need garments that will protect them from prolonged exposure to the water. Um, we even have garments that will protect us from disease. Hooray! Um, uh, again, we're living in you know this specific time where we have the COVID pandemic um, and what has come out of it. Uh, a lot of things, but one of the biggest things is the mask, the new everyone's new favorite accessory. Um, again, that is considered a technical garment that has a physical performance need. It needs to stop the spread of um, a virus. So therefore, again, if we sort of look at what it needs to do, um, a thicker fabric is going to pe perform better um, simply because it's not letting out um, breath, it's not letting out the droplets, things like that. It's better stopping them um, at the mouth of the wearer. Um, <laughs> tangent again, uh, there's a good test to see if your cloth mask is going to be a good performer. Um, it's a candle test. So if you are wearing your mask and you can blow out a candle, it's not very effective. It's not highly performing. It's not reaching its physical performance needs. It's not stopping those droplets. But if you cannot blow out your candle while wearing your mask, then it is. Anyways, that's my tangent. So again, these garments, um, and again, they can really reach into, you know, if we think about um, spacesuits, 
Um, that is an incredibly high physical performance that a garment needs to do. It needs to allow for a person to live within the vacuum of space, which is just simply amazing. Um, and the higher the physical performance, the harder it is to achieve, and the greater the need for achievement is, will make the garment more expensive. So let me break that down. So um, obviously if we imagine something on, a, on the high extreme of something like a spacesuit, um, that is the perfect example of something that is going to be very expensive because of its high phys physical performance needs. One, it needs to do something incredibly difficult, incredibly, incredibly difficult. That's more expensive because it takes longer to research and develop the materials, the construction, and the actual schematics of the suit. Um, so all that different research, that scientific research, um, is going to cost more money and therefore make the actual garment more expensive. Also, there is a very high need for it to be uh, fulfilled. So when the wearer is wearing the space suit, his need is to stay alive, um, which is an incredibly high need. Uh, so <laughs> that again, the higher the need, the more expensive, because the more sure you have to be of the garment's capabilities. And in a lot of times, people are willing to pay more uh, to achieve their fulfill fulfill uh, fulfillment of their need if their need is very high. So um, again, let's take something a, maybe a little bit more relatable, uh, like, like the fisherman over here. Um, his need is not as high as the astronaut because his life is not in danger. Um, it's simply just if the water gets in and his garment doesn't perform, um, he's going to have some cold, soggy feet and it's not going to be pleasant. Now, it depends on how high his need is to be comfortable, um, and that will relate to how much he's willing to spend on his garment. So if he's going fishing once a year, um, it's not a very high need, he's not spending a lot of time doing it, so it doesn't really need to perform that well. So he's not willing to spend as much money for his garment. However, if he's going to be there every week, maybe a few days a week, and he's going to be there all day, um, his comfort is going to be a higher need. So he'll be willing to spend more money on the physical performance of this garment than otherwise. Now, also in this category are sport garments. Um, this garment needs uh, to allow the wearer to move freely and enhance their ability in a specific sport. These types of garments have high physical performance needs and increase depending on the needs of the wearer. So again, just like here, these garments need to specifically perform in a, a, a very realistic, sort of tangible manner. So they need to not rip, they need to allow for movement, uh, they need to be durable, and in many cases they need uh, to aid the athlete in their specific sport. And we can see that very uh, well in um, these very high-tech um, Olympic uh, swimsuits. So this is an Olympic athlete for the American swimming team, and she has this very uh, form-fitting uh, a swimsuit which helps to sort of streamline her body uh, which will enhance her ability to swim. So again these are very very high performance needs, high physical performance needs. And you know we have uh, also on the sort of funner side I guess a little uh, a ballet costume uh, which has different than our typical sort of athletes because it needs to sort of look and move beautifully, it needs to be interesting um, when the where or the dancer moves within it, um, but also do the same things that uh, uh, stand up to stresses, uh, allow free and easy movement of the wearer, so on and so forth. Now, just like over here, we're going to see an increase in price as the wearer's needs increase. So, what do I mean by that? Well, if I'm just going out for a morning jog and I just need something comfortable and I'm not really that invested in my success at jogging. I'm just trying to maybe lose a few pounds. 
Um, I'm not trying to compete at any sort of professional level or whatever else. I'm not that into it. I just need something to comfy to move around in. My needs are very low for that garment. Um, so therefore, the physical performance of the garments that I'm going to wear don't need to perform that well, and I'm not going to spend a lot of money on it. However, if I am, say, an Olympic athlete, I'm sure that their swimsuits are bought for them, um, but let's say that I, I want to tr start to train to compete at a very high level or I'm very invested in this sport, I'm going to start to spend more money on my gear because my need for them to perform is higher. Okay, so that's our physical performance. Again, it's pretty easy to um, understand and um, it does make the garments more expensive, um, not only because it takes longer to sort of research what works well, so these garments are garments that are going to be rigorously tested, uh, but they can also require more expensive sort of specialty materials, so especially in the case of sort of swimsuits, or even with um, uh, other sorts of athletic wear, um, the materials themselves are going to be either specially developed or specially tested, um, which of course costs more money. Um, and of course, depending on what they need to do, if the material needs to literally stop fire from burning you, um, again, high need, difficult to do, it's going to be more expensive. So we have a few more physical performance um, issues. Uh, those again are sort of the main ones. These are kind of minor ones, um, but they, because they're a little bit more minor, they apply to a broader spectrum of garments. So I talked to the sort of um, base level of performance of, you know, physical performance of a garment. You need to be able to put it on and it needs to cover the bits it needs to cover. It needs to stay on. You need to be able to take it off. That's the base level. But on a sort of higher level, but in that same vein, we have fit and comfort. Garments that are well fit for a wearer are more comfortable and flatter the body. It can take extra time and care to create garments that fit the wearer well, and so can be more expensive. So I am showing an example of a tailored suit, which is you know a great example of um, how fit can cost more, how good fit can cost more. And again, it's a physical performance. It, it actually physically has to fit well on you. So in order to achieve a good fit, um, we can do one of two things, but both of those things are typically going to make that garment cost more. Um, on the very high end, the garment might be specifically fit for a customer. So uh, when we talk about a tailored suit, a man would go, or a woman, would go to a tailor, have their measurements specifically taken, and a suit made specifically for them and their body. Of course, that's unique, it's custom, it's one of a kind, and it takes a lot more effort and time to create than if we're just using a standard measurement chart and we just make it sort of standard. Of course, the fit will be much better, but of course, all that extra time, skill, and labor will make the garment cost more. Now, in addition to that, a uh, designer, if they're not going to make specific one-off custom uh, garments and still has fit as a concern, um, has a couple options. Um, and what they'll try to do is they'll try to just make more options of sizes. So they may, um, instead of just making the standard sizes, they'll make a standard iteration of sizes. They may make a uh, specifically sort of big and tall iteration. They may make a petite iteration. So they'll try to make lots of different sizes in hopes that it, the fit um, for whatever customer comes along, they'll be able to find a size that fits them well. Now making all these different sizes is a lot more expensive because of course you're putting more work into grading the different patterns um, and so on and so forth. So it is more expensive, um, but again, it does allow the customer to potentially find a better fit for them. In addition, we have durability. So that kind of comes, it sort of comes part and parcel with sewing quality. 
Um, but again, with specific clothing, you really want to see it be quite durable. So some clothing really needs to stand up to abuse. Um, durable clothing is often used as work clothing and is for any activity where the clothing itself is going to be subject to stress, abrasion, other sources of wear and tear. Uh, this type of clothing must be heavily reinforced and made from robust materials. So because of the extra reinforcement, because of the extra you know, quality of the materials, it will be uh, more expensive. And again, it needs to perform. This is sort of um, the epitome of something you want to buy and have it last for a long time. And here I have a uh, pair of Carhartt work overalls. Um, Carhartt is a brand that specializes in very durable work clothing um, that, again, matches up to this. Now they're a little bit more expensive because, of course, they have to perform physically very well. Okay, so um, now that we've done our physical performance, let's get into the realm of psychological performance which again can be a little bit harder to understand, but I think we'll get it by the end. The psychological performance needs of a garment refers to how the garment can affect the attitudes of the wearer and those around them. So again, moving back to that original slide, I mentioned that whenever we put on a garment, we kind of want that garment to do something. And what we want it to do is referred to as our needs. And depending on what occasion we're wearing the garment for, those needs will change. So to look at a, the very wide spectrum from one end to the other, let's look at casual clothing. So let's look at this occasion where I'm doing nothing but lying on the couch and napping. And this is the epitome of low need, uh, low psychological performance needs. Casual clothing is worn at times, again, when we have a low need for them to do anything. Um, it is usually a bit cheaper, um, worn either alone or in small intimate groups and on mundane occasions. So pretty much just nothing special. And we can imagine that. I'm not gonna go out today, I'm just gonna hang out on the couch, um, watch some streaming TV or whatever. Uh, I'm not going to bother too much with what I'm wearing. Why? I just want to be comfortable. My only need is to be comfortable, which is more of a physical need than a psychological need. Um, so, so long as it's comfortable, I don't care what I look like. No one's going to see me. Um, you know, I'm not presenting myself out there. Um, it's just a sort of private, casual, whatever else. And this is, again, an example of a zero psychological performance, mostly because no one's going to see me. So I don't need to communicate anything about myself to someone else, and I'm not really looking to communicate anything to myself as well, because it's kind of an off day. I don't need to amp myself up. I don't need to feel good about myself. I'm just going to hang out. On the complete opposite end of that spectrum, I have here, we have um, this lovely couple going to a black tie affair. Black tie affairs, again, are probably, again, the absolute opposite from the occasion of lying on the couch alone. So black tie occasions are incredibly high formal events um, that epitomize where clothing has a high psychological performance needs. Um, it is worn typically on very special occasions. Um, it's typically more expensive than usual and is worn when the wearer will be with many people, oftentimes in front of many, many people. Oftentimes where there will be pictures taken, where there will be press, so on and so forth. So um, again, here we have high psychological needs because a lot of people's eyes are going to be on us. We have a high need to express something about ourselves and simply a high need to simply fit in. So black tie affair in itself gives us parameters of which we are expected to meet. We are expected to dress up. Black tie refers to the, the um, a black tie of a tuxedo. Um, it's a guideline of formality. So not only you know are we dressing up because other people will see us, 
We want to look good for cameras and all these other people. We're dressing up because the occasion is special and typically to mark um, special occasions, uh, we dress up. Um, it's simply a way of uh, demarcating the fact that this is a, a particular occasion. We're going to do something different. We're going to dress up nicer. We're going to spend a little bit more money on our clothes because, again, the need is higher um, to communicate all these things. We have more things to communicate, and the need is higher to communicate them. Um, so on and so forth. So that's our sort of spectrum of psychological performance. But formality is not the only thing that affects psychological performances, and it's not the only need that we have. It's just a sort of good way to sort of generally um, uh, illustrate the spectrum from low need, low cost, low performance needs, to high need, high cost. Um, and very obviously, the more formal we go, the more dressy we go, um, again, is going to be more expensive. So let's look at some other areas of psychological performance that can affect how much a garment costs or how much a customer is willing to pay for a garment. This is by no means all of the psychological needs that we have, um, but it is just a sort of picking out of a few of them. Um, first, we have professional. So um, it is very common uh, for people, if they have, uh, are looking for a job, to go out and get a quote unquote interview outfit. Now they are going to pay a little bit more for this money and a little bit more depending on the needs of the job that they have. Now what are they asking? What are their psychological needs that they're asking of their garments? Well, people that will have a psychological performance need that is professional, they want um, their clothing to make them look trustworthy, capable, and professional. Now this is a need, and this need is going to vary depending on the person and depending on their job. Um, you know, of course, say something like a lawyer, if they show up to defend you in court and they're in ripped jeans and a raggedy old t-shirt, things aren't looking good. However, if they show up in a nice, clean, crisp, well-fitted suit, um, you might breathe a sigh of relief. Um, of course, this has no indication of their actual ability, um, but still, because we use clothing so readily and so ubiquitously throughout our culture to communicate things about ourselves, um, we can, we still uh, uh, judge people's abilities by what they're wearing. It might not be accurate, but it certainly is what's done. Um, and in a way, you know, they say don't judge a book by its cover. There is, you know, obviously a lot of truth by that. But since we are of our own free will adopting and buying certain clothing, we are by our own free will deciding to communicate certain aspects about ourselves to society. And again, depending on what those aspects we want to communicate and how badly we want to communicate them, that is referencing to psychological performance and the needs of that. So again, if I have a job where I need people to trust me, I need to look professional, I'm going to spend more money on clothing that makes me um, look trustworthy, capable, and professional. Now, as a designer, if I can design clothing that communicates this, I can charge more money for that garment because people with this high professional performance need of their garments will pay it. Moving on, we have a stylish, cool need. Um, again, another psychological performance need that uh, is very often sought after in clothing. So customers with this need want their clothing to make them look trendy, hip, and cool. So we, we simply want to look with it. We want it cute and trendy. We want to look modern. Um, whatever uh, words you want to use to describe it. Very popular need for people to get out of their clothes. 
um, almost a base level. People want to at, at least n not look sort of outdated or um, frumpy, let's say. Uh, so very, very common need we have out of our clothes. And again, designers that are particularly fashion forward, are particularly on the pulse of new trends, can typically ask for more money um, for their clothing because people with a high need to look stylish and cool will pay more money for it. Hence, you know, um, especially uh, brands that are lucky enough to have sort of been labeled as a stylish or cool um, company. I don't want to, you know, pick names or anything, but uh, I think one company that is really particularly uh, taken advantage of this psychological performance need, um, I, I would say as an example, it might be Supreme. Um, so they have well established a connection between their brand name logo, logo and being sort of stylish and cool. So they can simply put their brand name on whatever it is and charge a lot more money of it uh, for it. Now, why can they do that? Why is it successful? Um, simply because they have been able to attach their brand to this psychological performance need and those that have a high need to look cool, to look stylish, uh, will pay that extra money to achieve that goal, to fulfill that need. Next, we have sexy. Um, customers might want their co uh, clothing to make them look attractive and desirable. Um, and of course, this need um, is a sort of base level, you know, it, it, and sometimes they clash, so I certainly don't want to look sexy here. Um, but if I'm going out on a date and I want to impress my date, um, or maybe you're visiting your ex and you want to, uh, you know, kind of rub it in their face a little, you know, you have these needs to uh, uh, appear sexy and uh, attractive and desirable. Um, it's innate within all of us. Uh, and again, that might be a situation for the more normal customer. Here we have Jennifer Lopez at the billboards. Um, appearing sexy is a part of her sort of status as a celebrity. So she's willing to pay a lot of money for these extravagantly beautiful dresses that are very, very sexy um, to sort of maintain her status as a sex symbol because that's um, pretty much directly tied to uh, her, her financial gain. If she's not quote unquote sexy anymore, people aren't gonna buy her perfume, people are gonna be less likely to buy her clothing line, so on and so forth. So she has a very high need uh, to appear sexy. So again, she's going to spend more money um, to appear this way than someone with a lower need, uh, so on and so forth. So again, higher your need, more money you're willing to pay to achieve that need, to fulfill that need. Next is cultural signaling. So um, this goes in a lot of different categories. I just picked one of the pictures with a sports fan. So you might um, pick a specific item of clothing or style of clothing to help associate you with a cultural subgroup. So um, because clothing typically is meant to signal different bits of information about a wearer, um, most sort of cultural subgroups um, or you know just basic groupings uh, will have certain let's say trends or clothing or, or clothing details or styles of clothing uh, that will go along with that cultural subgroup to help signal to others, hey, I'm part of this group. Now, my example again is, is a sports fan and, and this is probably one of the most commonly seen uh, items of cultural signaling. Uh, fans of a certain sports team will wear garments that have the logo of the sports team on them. And they basically want to communicate, hey, I'm a Steelers fan, or hey, I'm a whatever sports team fan. But we see this iterated out in a lot of different ways. So um, we can see it in music. So, um, you know, you take something as a you know, very obvious example, like, um, let's say, emo. Um, 
people that are really into emo music uh, have to also, I guess, dress like it to signal that they are fans of it. And this is very common. This is especially very common um, in uh, youth groups in uh, the younger ages where um, young people are sort of developing their own identity. They have a need to sort of re rebel or experiment. And they're trying to find themselves. So they tend to sort of go in very extreme directions with their clothing um, and try out different things associated with potentially different sort of cultural subgroups. So again, if you think about, you know, um, people that are fans of a specific music genre, let's, let's just, for example, again, take sort of emo rock. They're going to have specific styles that they wear to signal their allegiance to that cultural subgroup. Um, and again, if you are a brand that can very well meet this need, you can pay a, a, a charge a little bit more for your uh, product. Uh, because if someone has a very high need to associate themselves, they need that need fulfilled and they're willing to pay more money to fulfill it. So, so on and so forth. Um, Again, this can be for many different cultural subgroups. You, you will see this, you know, um, maybe with, you know, skateboarders might wear specific types of, of pants and shoes. Um, uh, people that like a certain genre of movies, you know, maybe horror fans will uh, w let that sort of bleed into their dress. Um, and again, it's really varied by how much money they were willing to spend based on their needs. So how much are these people wanting to fit into this group? If they have a very high need to quote unquote fit in um, and communicate their allegiance to this group, they're willing to spend more money doing so. If it's a very small, they're probably not willing to spend that much. And they're probably not, if it's a very small, um, amount, you know, say I, I you know, like emo music, but I'm not going to go get some weird black haircut and get a, you know, septum pierce. Um, I'm not going to spend the money. My need isn't that great. I can just listen to music and not have to change my entire appearance to do it. Um, so again, that depends on your customer. Some smaller elements might bleed through, um, but again, that is not going to sort of relate to our psychological performance that much. Another big thing that uh, clothing is used to signal is wealth. Um, so a lot of people have a psychological need to uh, communicate their wealth via their clothing. They want to communicate wealth or financial success. And this sort of bleeds into sort of power, status, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and of course, this is mostly done with simply clothing that is very expensive. So in, uh, I chose the image because she's wearing furs, which is a traditionally very expensive fabric. And also, you know, big jewelry, big expensive jewelry is also one of those very traditional uh, signifiers uh, of wealth just simply from being so expensive. Um, but again, this is another thing that people might have a big need to try to communicate with others. Um, and if they want, have, have this big need, um, it's very important to them to communicate, you know, I am of a good status, I'm financially secure, successful even, um, they're going to spend more money on their clothes to try to signal that to others. Okay, so again, there's lots of other um, psychological performances that people may ask of their clothing to do. This is just sort of five uh, of the basic ones that we very, very often see uh, within fashion design uh, themselves. These are sort of the core tenets, but there are many, many um, additional psychological performance needs that we can see uh, because, of course, people are all very unique. They're very different. They're individualistic. Um, so with every unique person is its own unique blend of psychological performances that they need to get out of their clothing. And of course, even with one person, we can see them uh, needing these at different occasions. You know, at the job, I need to be professional. On my date, I need to be sexy. With my friends, I need to be cool. 
um, at my high school reunion, I need to look wealthy, so on and so forth. So um, the better you are able to achieve these needs, to fulfill these needs for customers, the more you can charge for your product. And this is important to remember because this is not tied to anything that's really making the garment cost more. Uh, the other ones were very sort of cut and dry. Expensive fabric, more expensive to buy, therefore garment is more expensive. Um, complex labor, comp complex labor. Complex labor takes longer and needs higher skill sets, therefore is more expensive. Um, it's, it's very cut and dry, but this is, you know, I can sell anything that fulfill these needs for less, but why when your customer is willing to pay more? In fact, it's not good. Um, just based on, this, on the psychological um, sort of mechanisms of the mind, um, I'm a customer, I'm going to trust in my dollar and how much things cost. I know it might seem counterintuitive, but as customers, this is generally seen to be true across the board that when I need something to perform better, I want to spend more money on it. It's reassuring myself that I am getting um, the product that will better fulfill my needs. Okay? This might not always be true, by the way, um, but we look for it. For example, I want to give a bottle of wine as a gift. I don't, I'm not going to get the very cheap, unless I don't like the person, I'm not going to get the cheap bottle of wine. I want it to be a nice gift, so I'm going to spend a little bit more money than I normally would. Is the wine really going to be any better? Maybe, maybe not. But I'm going to reassure myself by spending a little bit more money that this is nice, this is a, this is a higher quality, um, the needs of this being a good gift is going to be fulfilled. Same here. Um, there's really nothing that requires the garment be um, priced higher, but if that is the designer's um, sort of aim to fulfill these needs, they may want to make it more expensive simply to convince the client that yes, Yes, this will fulfill your needs simply by being a little bit more expensive. Hmm. Um, this is really due to the fact that we associate cost with quality. Now, is everything that costs more of higher quality? No. But for the most part, um, we associate things of higher cost with higher quality. So in the absence of you know, really rigorous knowledge of the product um, or really obje objective analyzation, um, which tends to be quite absent in most consumer experiences, we simply look at the cost, see it costs a little bit more, see it might fulfill the needs that we need them to, um, and happily fork over more um, because that extra amount that we're paying is sort of added insurance that our needs are going to be met. Okay, so um, this pretty much wraps up our price points and what makes garments cost what they do. Um, hopefully you can take all of this information as a designer and it will help you design for the appropriate price point. Um, for instance with our psychological performance, like Say I have a garment that is simple construction, um, sort of cheap material, so on and so forth. I would pretty much be limited to a lower price point if I didn't design it, you know, um, to be very, very sexy. So I have this, you know, gorgeous, interesting design that is incredibly um, uh, sexy. So now what I can do is I can sell it at a higher price point, even though the materials and construction don't really warrant it, but those customers that really need to fulfill their desire to look sexy will pay more money for this garment. Okay, so this is another way we can kind of wiggle in and out of price points. 
So it can be kind of overwhelming, but just remember that price points themselves are kind of blurry and you know it's good to sort of just um, focus on one general range. So don't have garments that are really, really cheap and really, really expensive in one collection. Try to just narrow it down and focus in on one range and make sure that all of your garments are sort of sitting um, and are relatively close to each other in quality, in material cost, in um, uh, uh, performance uh, needs, in their ability to um, fulfill the needs uh, performance-wise. Um, so uh, that's about it for today. I uh, hope you learned a little bit something about what goes into garments uh, and how they cost or why they cost what they do. Alright guys, be well and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.